Welcome back to Reading Sisters. I am Naomi, and I'm going to read The One and Only Ivan, Part 6. If you, I have already posted Part 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 of The One and Only Ivan. If you have not watched it, I recommend watching it before you watch this video. It would help you catch up a lot. We are going to be reading the page, the last page we read in part five just to get a refresher so we can just refresh our minds of what we heard in part five so yeah. Okay, so last time, we were just going to be reading this chapter and then that one, even though I did already read this chapter last time, I would just like to give people, new people, a refresher. Okay, the one and only Ivan. When all humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she, I ask, when he returns. She was shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay, and I told her not to worry because you were going to save her. I glare at him. You told her that? You promised Stella. Bob lowers his head. I wanted to make the kid feel better. I shouldn't have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I point to Stella's domain, and for a moment, it seems like I've forgotten how to breathe. I wanted to make Stella happy, I guess. But I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold, but tonight it hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You are the one and only Ivan, he says. Mighty silverback. He licks my chin, and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it, Bob commands. I look away. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer, so Bob licks my, lo my nose until I can't stand it any longer. I am the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you forever forget it, he says. When I gaze at the food, food court skylight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded, shrouded in clouds. Okay, so that was my refresher page, so I'm going to start. Once upon a time, all night, Ruby moans and sniffles. I place my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently, get some sleep, please, for your sake and mine, and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he is on my stomach. I hear a stirring, Ivan, Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs. I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunt and my cousins too, I know I say, because it's all I can think of. Ruby sniffles. <laughs> I can't sleep. Do you know any stories? Ah. Ah. Okay. The way Aunt Stella died. Not really, I admit. Stories are Stella's specialty. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. She puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan? I scratch the back of my head. I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true. Bob says, trying to be helpful, Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. <sighs> oh, well, that's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for long, horrible minutes. Then I hear myself saying, once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. The grunt. I was born in a place humans call Central Africa, in a dense rainforest so beautiful no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away, the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what might be, might yet be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided my twin's name, Tag. 
Oh, how I loved to play tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her, and we would bounce on the tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant enough. Ah! The game never got old, although my father might have disagreed. Oh, I'm not sure if you guys can hear that, but it's currently raining outside. Um, the weather hasn't been that well lately. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves. I used the juice from fruit, but mostly I used mud. And that is what they called me, mud. To a human, mud might not sound like much, but to me, it was everything. Protector. My family, which humans called a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were ten of us. My father, the silverback, my mother and three other adult family females, a juvenile male called a black pack back, and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then as families, Will, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl, and for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit, for our morning feast at the finest branches for our night nest. He was everything a silverback is meant to be. A guide, a teacher, a protector. And nobody could just be like my father. A perfect life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different except that a gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system for the baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther and farther away from the safety of its mother's arms. He learns the skill he will need as an adult, how to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly, or they will fall apart in the middle of the night, how to beat your chest, cup your palms to amplify the sound, how to go vining from tree to tree, don't let go, how to be kind, be strong, be loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was for a while a perfect life. The end. One day, a still day, when the hot air hummed, the humans came. Vine. After they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped dark crate that smelled of urine and fear. Somehow, I knew that in order to live, I had to let my old life die. But my sister could not let go of our home. It held her like a vine stretching across the miles, comforting, strandling, strangling. We were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped. The Temporary Human It was Mac who pried open the crate, Mac who bought me, and Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers, I drank from a bottle, I slept in human beds, stat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger too, especially when I broke something, which was often. Here is what I broke while I lived with Mac and Helen. One crib, 46 glasses, seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three shower curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, three toes, my own. 
I broke the blender when I squeezed two tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue into it. I broke my toes attempting to swing from a lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses. Well, it turned out there are many ways to break a glass. Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me in their convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered me french fries and a strawberry shake. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up and said, Could I have something extra ketchup for my kid? I went to the baseball games, to the grocery stores, to a movie theater, even to the circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode a little motorbike and blew out candles on my birthday. My life as a human was a glamorous one. Although my parents' traditional sorts would have not approved hunger. In my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with thousands of islands dressing and caramel apples and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned, but hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, lying alone in my poo pajamas, I felt hungry for the skilled touch of grooming friend, for the chill for cheerful grunts of playing fight for the easy safety of my nearby troop foraging through the shadows. Remembering what happened to Tag, I told myself, don't think about the jungle. Still sometimes I lay awake, wishing for the warmth of another just like me, asleep in a night nest of tender prayer plant leaves. I liked having a sip of soda poured into my mouth like a... bubbling waterfall, but every now and then I longed, I longed to search for a tender stalk of air root to feel the cheese of a mango just out of reach. One day, Helen came home with something large and flat wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excitedly as she tore the paper and painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit in a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big, idea, big deal. This is fine art. It's called a still life, Helen explained, and I think it's lovely. I dashed over to examine the painting, marveling at the colors and shapes. See, said Max's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up poop and throw it at squirrels, Max says. <laughs> um, okay. I couldn't take my eyes off the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They look so real, so inviting. So edible. I reached out to touch a grape, and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan, don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, go get a hammer and a nail, would you? While Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered with thick chocolate frosting on the counter. I like cake. Love it. In fact, but it wasn't eating. I was thinking about... It was painting. The frosting peaked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looked rich and gooey, dark and smooth. It looked like mud. I scooped a handful of frosting and I scooped up another. I headed to the refrigerator door. It was perfect, an empty white paint waiting canvas. The frosting wasn't any easy to work with as jungle mud. It was stickier and, of course, more tempting to eat. But I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have eaten a little cake, too. I don't remember what I was trying to paint. A banana, most likely. I suppose I knew I was going to get in trouble, but at the moment, I just didn't care. I wanted to make something, anything, the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. Punishment. I soon learned that humans can screech even louder than monkeys. After that, I was never allowed in the kitchen. Babies. Back in those days, the Big Top Mall was smaller it had a pony ride, a wooden train that bustled around the parking lot, a few brigade old parrots, and Shirley Spider Monkey. But when Mac brought me a baby gorilla dressed in crisp tuxedo to the mall, everything changed. People came from far and wide to have their picture taken with me. They brought me blocks and toy guitar. They held me in their laps. Once I even held a baby in mine. She was small and slippery. Bubbles flowed from her lips. She squeezed my fingers. Her rear was puffy with padding. Her legs bowed like bent twigs. I made a face. She made a face. I grunted. She grunted. I was so afraid 
that she would fall, that I squeezed her tightly, and her mother yanked her away. I wonder if my mother ever worried about dropping us. We always held on. That's easier to do when your mother is furry. Human babies are not an ugly lot, but their eyes are like our baby's eyes. Too big for their faces. Beds. One day, after many weeks of talking loud, of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know what the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. My old nests were woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like his bathtub, cool green cocoons. Mac's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made a sleeping sound like the rumble my father used to make it, when all is well, a sound from deep inside his belly. My Place Mac grew sullen, I grew bigger, I became what I was meant to be, too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, too big for human life. I tried to stay calm. When I saw my domain, I was thrilled, and who wouldn't have been? It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no toilets to drop. Max keys into it. Max keys into it. It never had a tire swing. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow, I didn't realize I'd been here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, watch returns on TV. But many days, I forget what I'm supposed to be. Am I a human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. Nine thousand eight hundred and seventy six days. Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob too is snoring. But my mind is still racing for perhaps the first time I ever Okay, wait, sorry. Uh oh. for perhaps the first time ever I've been remembering. It's an old story to remember. I have to admit, my story has a strange shape, a stunned beginning and an endless middle. I counted all the days I've lived with humans. Gorillas count as well as anyone. Although it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the wild, I've forgotten so many things, and I always know precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of my magic markers Julia gave me. I make an X on a small one on my painted jungle wall. I make more X's and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. My mark looks like this. The rest of the night, I mark the days, and when I am done, my wall looks like this. And so on until there are 9,876 X's. Mar marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. <sighs> well, wasn't that something? Well, I just finished part six of The One and Only Ivan. That's going to be all for today. I'm going to say this for a second time. If you have not, please watch part one, two, three, and four of The One and Only Ivan. Now question of the day if you were stuck like Ivan for as many days as he was what would you call yourself a human or a gorilla if imagine if you were put in the jungle and kept in a forest or in a nest, would you call yourself a human or a gorilla? Living a gorilla life. But I would say, if I was in the jungle, I would say I'm a human who is living a gorilla life. Well, you can answer your the question of the day down below in the comments. And I'm asking you to please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell if you like this video. It lets us know if you want more and want to hear more of the one and only Ivan. 
Also, comment down below what other books you think would do well on our channel and you would like us to read. Thank you for watching The One and Only Ivan Part 6. This was Naomi reading. Goodbye.